Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. Excited to get Darwin Cook comics on the show, Ed. But before we dive into this one, Patreon, how about some plugs? Patreon.com slash Ed Piscor is where I'm serializing my Red Room comics at this very moment, man. Three bucks will get you the complete archive. It's about murder on the dark web, Jim, for fun and profit. Uh, two stories, two, two complete stories are almost up there uh, in total as, as of this recording. Uh, it's going to keep rocking for quite a while, man. I've got hundreds and hundreds of pages that need to be drawn and hundreds that are drawn. Yeah, look at that, man. <laughs> Fam- family fair for Christmas. Yes. Uh, three bucks gets you the archive new strips every Tuesday. Looks cool, man. There'll be more news about the comic in 2021 for uh, the print edition. I am here to answer a question about these two Street Angel volumes. People have been asking me what is in each book, if there's overlap, and there is not. These are completely different collections, so if you have one of these books and you like it, highly recommend the other one. This is the hardcover that went out of print recently, and this is Street Angel, Deadly Girl Alive, the Image Comics collection from about a year ago, but still in print, available wherever comics are sold. It's full-color collection. It's a uh, ninja superhero on a skateboard. So kind of the perfect comics for uh, any reader in your life that likes action and superhero comics and available wherever comics are sold. But the reason we're here today, Ed, is to uh, dive into The Man with the Getaway Face. This is part of Darwin Cook's adaptations of Richard Stark's Parker series. And what happened is he was contracted to do, I guess, four adaptations. This is the second book in the Parker series. Of like... 28 books. Yeah, lots of books. And so he had a couple that he wanted to do, uh, but unfortunately there's, well, fortunately, unfortunately, whatever, there's information in The Man with the Getaway Face that's really important to Parker's story because after the events of book one, he changes his look. And so you need to acknowledge that, and that's kind of what this is designed to do. And you can see, unlike these graphic novels that are, you know, 150 or 200 pages, this is a much shorter, much more like a comic book size. And what happens is, this is a lead-in to the outfit. So this is actually reprinted in the outfit, the second book in the series, as you know, 28 or 32 pages chapter early on that kind of explains the change in his look. We're looking at this because I, I like the Parker series overall, but I love this piece because it's oversized. So there's your standard comic book to give you an idea in case you haven't seen this prelude. Uh, you know, the size of it. It's it's an uh, inch and a half, two inches taller than a regular comic book. And IDW sold this thing for two bucks. I think this was, possibly they lost money or broke even, but I think it was promo. It was a it's way a to like, leader. you know, some people were reluctant maybe to try a graphic novel if, if they're not familiar with the creator or the source material. So put out a $2 good looking book like this and try to bring in a few more readers. And uh, they made a great object. I love whenever publishers do this kind of thing where it's like, we're going to do this thing. It's part promo and they make something that really looks cool. Yeah, it was it was a thrill uh, to read this. And, and I think about it in that context, you know, and instead of, you know, putting down 10 or 15 bucks for, for the big book, put down two dollars. You put that in uh, on the case at the at the comic shop. It sticks out higher than all the rest of the comic books. Pure white with black lettering on top of it to like. It, it's got to be attractive from a million miles away. And then when you take a look at that art, man. A lot of attitude in that art. Sublime. Also, by the way, the fact that, like, uh, these Parker books, you know, they take place in, like, you know, some nondescript time. But it's like, you, you're seeing old cars. What was plastic surgery like back then, boy? <laughs> <laughs> that's a dark, that's a dark uh, thought for, for, for this story, especially whenever he's going to some, you know, black market surgeon. This is, this is, to this uh, day, there, there are black market <laughs> surgeons who are put, shooting cement into people's asses to give them like Kardashian booties and then they're getting rejected and all <laughs> fucked oh, up. Man. Well, let's, uh, let's dig into this. One of the interesting pieces with this. Uh, and it's and it's described here. There's kind of an intro from Darwin Cook on the inside front cover. This is very close to the actual size original art. And if you go uh, do a Google search for original art from the Parker series, one of the amazing things is what is on that original art. The lettering. Darwin Cook does his own lettering, hand lettering that's on the original art. So amazing. And talk about very, very few pieces of original art these days are done that way. The other part that's on the originals is this tone, which is printed here in kind of a, a yellow ochre-like color. I like it. looks great. What's it look like on the original art? On the original art, it's blue. Okay. And I don't know what the material is, if it's like a marker or watercolor or what it is exactly, 
But, you know, again, to kind of give you a sense of scale, um, and I guess we'll, let me open up to the page that we have so you can compare them. You know, they're printed much smaller, so it's kind of neat to see these at a pretty close to the actual size, and then to think, like, this is probably closer to the original art because of the blues mm -hmm. that are used. But I don't know if it's markers or what. You get to see some of that variation. It doesn't show up as much because this color is light, but you can see it in the blues where it's an uneven piece. Yeah. Adds some texture. Really great. And also looks like illustration from that 50s, 60s time period. You know, Robert McGinnis kind of stuff. It makes me think of knowing his animation career, like it feels like very detailed kind of storyboards type of type of artwork or, or like mock-up artwork and i'm not saying that in a pejorative or insulting way uh there is definite speed to this but it reads sublimely oh man it is it's, it it really does and that's the magic of my favorite comics are often that part that's hard to describe because it only unlocks itself in the reading i think it looks good but man like you say it just reads so well i mean they pull off a heist in this comic with no words and they talk about it they and then you just watch the heist unfold Good luck. You got to do a lot of sketchbook work to, to stage something like that. It is. We often talk about how car chases are impossible to draw. This is the same kind of deal. And, you know, you're seeing it where, where he's pulling out maps and everything, telling this story very clearly of what's happening, sets up the players. I think there's four main players in this, not counting the, you know, like the guards that they're going to knock off. But he goes and scopes the place out. He's looking at roots of like, where do we hide cars? Where do we, you know, get back together? Staking out the joint. It's amazing. And you know, first thing that I note is there's no hard panel border edges. I like that look. It reminds me of Gil Kane Savage. You know, mm -hmm. we've seen lots of these car comic books over the years that do this. And I associate it with a more sophisticated visual kind of look. It feels a little more mature or something. Very pleasing to the eye. You have to be very thoughtful uh, when you're when you're choosing to do that because tangents are very easy tangents abound uh you could you could really screw up your page compositions and fuck up word flow uh, or just uh storytelling flow uh the second color uh help helps a whole lot to it's kind of break up the, it does. The, the panels so that um it avoids really any confusion yeah it's man it's so strong you know the other thing that i see when i look at this well two guys David Mazzucchelli, some sure. of like the rubber blanket stuff reminds me of this a little bit. Some of the mark making, things like those skies and just some of the shadows on the faces. And then, of course, Alex Toth, you know, with these great spot blacks and shapes that are applied. But man, look at like the character designs. You know, it's he's good at a lot of stuff, Darwin yeah. Cook. And a lot of that is on display in this. These are some of my kind of favorite panels like in that comics. Stuff too. I was just there, looking there's at a good that. one in Charles Forsman's uh, "The End of the Fucking World," where it shows like all the little animals that uh, that the kids killed over time. In but <laughs> I, I I love that stuff. Little diagrams. Yeah, very much like a uh, a game or something where you're doing inventory of what what tools do we need? What are we out there to get? And it's part of the heist. You know, like they go through. They're going to take a couple days to get this the materials together that they need, and those materials include trucks. <laughs> You know, it's not just what goes in your pocket. Trucks, because you need a fly whip to put... It, well, you need you need a getaway car. Yes. Uh, these aerial shots to really illustrate, like, they talk about what they're going to do. And then, as you say, big wordless sequences, they actually do it. So it's really kind of cool. You know loosely what's going to happen, but this is it actually happening for you. Really good storytelling in that regard. So some cool drawing problems, too, because, like, you, you would want to have both binocular circles in a panel but then it would shorten your uh image area a whole lot man so this easily communicates binoculars so that you could draw that panel as big as possible that's a great point I i'm glad that you say that i would never think in a million years to crop a binocular shot like that right. and you're right it's it's a better panel for it it's very interesting again you know like i said he Cook does a lot of stuff really well as a cartoonist, and I think that's one more example. And that could come out of his animation background, where, like, you know, that may have been a pan if this is some sort of animation. Hey, there's so much movement in in this comic. Like, you could just tell he, he developed some muscles that the, your average cartoonist just doesn't have. Yeah, nobody feels static, ever. Mm -mm. Always some acting going on, always some bounce. Uh, and, and you feel it even with, like, the panel-to-panel, -panel, like, the camera movement. Like you said, if it feels like it could be a pan at times and, you know, second to second sequences. Things feel like they have weight. You know, it feels like that hand is really pushing against the truck uh -huh. to, to open up that door. And he seems to also understand 
like film theory when it comes to the shots that he chooses. Yeah, there are a lot of these. I, I think this is similar to the binocular shot where it's like, where do you actually crop this? Do we need to see the whole truck? Do we need to see the truck next to it? And it's like, no, nah, put, you know, center that action, draw it the size you want it and wherever the, the crop ends, it ends. Yeah, really good stuff. And again, I love these wordless sequences. You get a whole heist like that. Yeah. That's pretty damn cool. Great to see like some of the sound effect lettering. I think it looks amazing and it's neat to see it at approximately full size where you can see like these marks and sometimes like the smaller figures, they're, they're so abstract. They read really well. I would labor over that kind of drawing and you don't need to. It's very instructive to me in that regard. And give all the characters a look. You know, I think that's part of an animation background where, like, you learn to design characters that stand out by shape and weight and all these different qualities, as opposed to comics where often it's like you have a male figure, you have a female figure, put a different color costume on them so that they stand, so we know who, who who's who. You know what's cool, though? He, like, he doesn't tip his hand with the physiognomy of, of, of the faces, so it's not these cliche, like, where you could easily, like, tell, like, okay, that's a that's a motherfucker right there. Like, that's yeah. going to be a bad guy or whatever. And this is a great reveal. Because earlier, uh, they take a look in the back of a truck, and you only see their faces, and they're like, man, I like, wanted something a little nondescript. Like, I didn't want something so over the top. Uh, so, so you're, like, almost reading this, like, waiting for the moment to see what the hell they're exactly talking about. It's great. That whole sequence is great, because they, again, rip open that back door, pull out your, your, your tracks that you're going to drive down. Again, so cartoony and simple, the shape of that. Pop into this car that we don't quite see. You get a logo, the engine revs, buckle up, and here we go. And I'm, I'm, awesome. I'm ignorant to cars, and I'm sure that's a real logo. Do you know which one that is? I don't. I don't. I don't know if that's supposed to be a Ferrari. I don't know. It's a I, good question. I, ask me about comics. <laughs> <laughs> but the story is, these four people that are pulling off this crime, Parker does not trust the, uh, the woman who sets up this job. And so that's why they need the fast car to get out ahead of her at the rendezvous point because he assumes she's not going to be at the place where they, uh, where they originally made plans to meet up. And sure enough, we see her car stop. They do get there in time with the fast car. We see her car stop, open the door, and throw out the guy who was Parker's acquaintance that, that brought him into the job. So she double-crosses him, stabs him in the chest, and, uh, and a good thing Parker was right. So it's a job where they're pulling a crime, but also having double uh, double crosses involved. You got to. It's, it's complex, this is man. Noir, this is a noir gimmick, man. Uh, also, the invention of the spike strip yes. is a real fun piece, man. Because like it makes me wonder if like at the writing of the novel, if this if the spike strip was either new or if they invented it, like in in the in the in the book. It's such a good invent. Like I, I am guessing it's a real a and real because, piece because yeah, it is such a. Uh, so effective and, and kind of clever. And just because it's cartoonist kayfabe spike strip, it's a new gimmick. <laughs> <laughs> it's very economic storytelling, though. You know, to do as much as he does without words, and never, I'm never lost. No. It's always very, very clear. That kind of storytelling is my favorite part of comics. You know, thinking about this, if you haven't read this at home and you love, you know, we do a lot of Frank Miller and Sin City and stuff. This is in that line. You know, this is, these are crime stories that are told really well. I prefer Parker, I prefer Darwin Cook's adaptations to the books. I'm not a huge fan of the, uh, the Parker novels. They're okay, uh, but they're not my favorite crime fiction. But these adaptations, they sing. Yeah. They're really, really great because there is a structure of a story there that he has to work with. Parker's a cool character. L less than an anti-hero I don't even he's a villain he's a professional know? thief that's, yes. that's like we should have probably said <laughs> at the beginning because we would I think when you see this and when I first heard of Parker I didn't read the books like I just assumed that it was like a Mike Hammer private eye guy right yeah no no he, he's a bad guy man uh, but really compelling stuff and like I said I prefer this format to the actual original source material Darwin Cook knew what he was doing whenever he got hold of this property or pitched it or conceived of it he had a vision, man, and it really comes through. And then trouble, that guy who was stabbed is still alive. So pick up the outfit and see how this plays out. Um, but four of these in all, I think he put out four of these books in five years, which is, this was a cartoonist who was not wasting time. Yeah. You know, he has a small window where he's working, but produces a really big amount of work in that time frame. Uh, but as a, you know, 
cartoonist kayfabe we love kind of the objects the printed pieces this is one of those standout pieces absolutely i'm a little surprised idw or again whatever company hasn't copied this format um you know assuming that that this was profitable or break even i mean you could sell this for 10 bucks probably and, and have buyers but it's a beautiful format and it really does showcase the art nicely now getting art of this quality is a lot harder than reproducing the format right but uh, a really cool object and like you say Ed, i bought this off the newsstand whenever it came out in i don't know 2011 2012 sometime around there had no idea it was happening walked into the comic shop and saw it right away and was just smitten <laughs> Yeah, good stuff. Not going to be the last Darwin Cook we show on this channel by Absolutely. a long shot. And again, I would encourage anybody, if you see this and you haven't tried those Parker books, pick one up. They are very, very fun crime comics. Absolutely. Get out of here, Jim. Yes. All right, K-Favors, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when uh, new vids are available. And shouts to the uh, increasing volume of subscribers who have been coming to the channel day after day, hundreds a day. What do you got in stores, Jim? Uh, Street Angel, Deadly Scroll Live from Image Comics, uh, Superhero, Ninja on a Skateboard, get it wherever comics are sold, and the Plain Janes collection available wherever comics are sold about a bunch of high school uh, kind of outcasts who turn to public art as a way to spice up their lives. Patreon.com slash Ed is where I'm serializing my Red Room comic strip. Three bucks get you the archive. Two complete stories are up there uh, almost in total as we speak. New strips every Tuesday. That's for the early adopter. The X-Men Grand Design Omnibus in stores now. It's out of our warehouses, so if you see it, scoop it up. And the Ed Piscor Studio Edition is uh, in stores as well, but they are going uh, fast. You can subscribe to Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video to keep up with everything that we are doing. You can find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Give them a set of margin orders, Jimmy, and we'll be on our way. Read more comics.